Con. It's Alyssa Miller, and I am super excited to be here with you guys today. So let's just dive right in. We're talking about how to build practical security programs, and I'm going to use a little bit of a unique uh, metaphor, if you will, as we describe this. So but let me first start by just introducing myself for those of you that don't know me. Again, my name is Alyssa Miller. First and foremost, I'm a hacker, I'm a cybersecurity researcher, and I'm an advocate. Just means that I really like getting out and talking to people about my ideas for how we can be better in cybersecurity. Professionally, I am the Business Information Security Officer for S&P Global Ratings, leading the divisional security strategy for their ratings division. I'm also an author and a blogger. I'll be releasing my first book fairly soon. I blog pretty regularly on my website. And I've also, I've spent the last 20 years as a barbecue aficionado, if you will, uh, pit master, whatever you want to call me. But I love barbecue. And in fact, those of you that follow me on Twitter, you might be familiar with a lot of the pictures of barbecue and smokers and things. This is the smoker, I, one of my smokers. Um, again, if you follow me, you know that I've actually got kind of a collection out there. Um, but you know, barbecue is something I share a lot on social media. And I got to talking with some folks about barbecue and started to realize as we were talking about you know, some of the rules around how to make really good barbecue and some of these just there, there's certain things that just if you're going to make barbecue you, you have to follow these rules they're just they're they're not disputable and i started realizing and as i was talking with this other person about this is actually a really good metaphor for you know how we should be building programs in cyber security as you all know we are struggling with breaches in cybersecurity in a way that we never have before. We see things like S3 buckets. This isn't news to us. This is still happening. We're seeing configurations around S3 buckets that lead to lead to breaches of data. Docker containers being compromised over and over again. Why? Because we include software that's vulnerable. Or maybe we don't configure those environments quite the way they should be. And of course, now supply chain attacks like we saw with SolarWinds or Kaseya, they're, they're all the rave right now. We're seeing attackers leverage these very tasty targets, if you will, because they have a wide attack uh, pattern when they are able to compromise just one target. But why are these happening? Let's look at some of the things that are occurring in our industry right now. So. A couple years ago, I looked at vulnerability themes while I was managing a penetration testing consulting program. And I, I, I did some trend analysis. I looked at what are we seeing in terms of the top five themes around vulnerabilities that we were discovering in our penetration test. And what we saw was that 40% of what we discovered were just simple configurations where doing a configuration differently would alleviate the particular vulnerability we found. And as I plotted this over time and I drew a trend line, you can see it was a horizontal trend over the course of three years where over and over again, a pretty steady about 40% of our vulnerabilities were configuration issues. So the following year, I found myself working for an organization called Sneak. And as part of our state of open source security report, I looked at vulnerabilities in Docker images. And what I could see over the, the last two years that we had done this, so in 2019 and, or excuse me, 2018 and 2019, the number of vulnerabilities that existed in official images on Docker Hub was kind of astonishing. You see where Node.js in particular, that, that base image, that official image in Docker Hub had just hundreds of vulnerabilities, but even across the board, don't, don't lose sight because of that outlier of how many vulnerabilities exist in things like the Postgres or Nginx or MongoDB, all these different official images that were available on Docker Hub that people are using to deploy their applications. So as another part of that open source security report, I looked at the vulnerabilities we were finding in open source packages. Again, what's old is new. These aren't new vulnerabilities. We see cross-site scripting was the most common found vulnerability. 
Cross-site scripting has been on the OWASP top 10 since I think it started in 2003. Everything that we're finding, we, we just struggle in cybersecurity to eliminate the same vulnerabilities that bite us over and over and over again. So I started looking at this. How do we get better? You know, and I started to think about it in terms of how do you make great barbecue? So when we talk barbecue, one of the hardest pieces or uh, dishes to make in barbecue is the brisket. Brisket is this tough cut of beef, and if you don't do it just right, it doesn't turn out well. And a lot of people struggle to get just the right brisket. And so I thought, I'll take a look at some of the rules we follow when we're making brisket, and I'm going to tie that into how we do good security practices and how we build a practical security program. So with no further ado, I'm going to dump it, jump right in. I've got five tips for you on not only how to make a better brisket, but also how to build a better cybersecurity program. Now, rule number one, if I'm going to make a brisket, is that planning and preparation wins the day. What you see here is me trimming that brisket. You have to plan if you're going to make a brisket. You don't just go buy one at the store and slap it on the smoker and let it go. You've got to trim it. You've got to plan it because it's going to take hours and hours and hours. So you got to have your day laid out ahead of time and know what you're going to do. It's the same thing with cybersecurity. You can't just walk into the boardroom without a plan and start asking for money and saying, this is, you know, I need money because we're going to do this thing and it's going to make us better at cybersecurity. No, you've got to have a plan. And that starts with knowing how you're going to sell it to the board. All too often when we go into board meetings or meetings with our executive team or even just our managers, we throw around FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. We think we're going to scare them into spending money where we know it needs to be spent in order for us to get better at cybersecurity. But the reality is that doesn't work. And neuroscience tells us why. So there was a study at North Shore University Hospital in upstate New York a while back where they looked at how they could encourage people to be more diligent about washing their hands. And at first what they did was they told them, we're going to put cameras in the wash areas. And if we see you not washing your hands, you'll, you'll be punished. And what they found was that didn't help. And the reason is because when you use threats and fear, it just discourages people from taking action because it creates a fight or flight and they tend to avoid those threats. So instead, what they did at this hospital was they then put up signs that just gave people encouragement. When they noticed they washed their hands, it, it gave them a congratulations or a good job. And what they found was that little bit of reward actually encouraged actions. And where they were getting only about 10 to 15% compliance in hand washing before, now they were suddenly getting 85 to 90%. And it's the same when we talk to our business leaders about our cybersecurity initiatives. Instead of trying to scare them, we need to encourage them with rewards. So if we want to put a reward out there, that, that carrot versus stick argument that we hear a lot about, the good option is to talk about how it can, this cybersecurity initiative can save us money or maybe gain us some efficiency. So if I see that I've got a high level of requests to rebuild workstations because of malware infections, Maybe I talk about how this new endpoint security tool or this new email security tool will help reduce those numbers. And that's going to you know, build up that efficiency. But better is to say, how can I take this cybersecurity initiative and parlay that into tackling a wish list item? One of those things that our IT team has been wanting to do for years that we can't get to because they're so swamped in having to do all of those rebuilds and things like that. That makes it even better because now I'm enabling the business a little bit. And what's ideal or the best option is when I can tie that security initiative into an innovation that's gonna enable new business and new revenue streams or establish us as a market leader. So going into those conversations, being able to present this cybersecurity strategy, maybe I'm going to launch a CASB program in our cloud environment that's going to allow us to do new tools or create a new portal or whatever it is that's going to generate more revenue for us. That's what wins the day when we're talking to our executives. Now, 
if you're going and you're talking to your executives, you also need to understand how to talk to them. When I go to a board meeting, there's a couple things that I need to keep in mind. First and foremost is I'm probably only going to get about three minutes to make my case. So when I build that deck, I'm putting the most important things, that, that strongest message that I want them to get, I'm putting that right at the beginning. Then I can follow it up with all the supporting details and, and you know stats and numbers and things, but I've got to put that out there first. And the reason I got to do that is because I've got to expect to be interrupted. Those meetings, those executive leaders, especially when they're not security folks, they have a lot on their mind and they just want to cut to the chase. They want to get their questions answered. And so they are going to interrupt you from time to time. And you've got to expect that you can't get frustrated with it and you have to structure your presentation accordingly because they are going to be answering questions, asking questions, and you need to be ready to answer those questions. Anticipate what it is that they're going to ask for and go in ready with those answers. You might get away with it once or twice in answer to a question saying you have to dig a little deeper or you, you need to come back with that information. But by and large, you've got to have those answers ready. So anticipate what it is that they're going to ask you about that initiative that you're bringing forth. And that will win the day. Second rule. Pitmaster rule number two is low and slow. You can't rush it. You see here the thermometer. This is the thermometer monitoring the temperature of my smoke chamber where I've got that brisket sitting. I want to keep it at 225 and I want to cook that brisket for hours and hours and hours. It might take six, eight, ten hours to cook that brisket to the temperature that I want it to be. I can't force it because if I force it, instead of that coming out as a nice, juicy, tender brisket, it's going to come out as a tough lump of meat that nobody's going to want to eat. And it's the same thing when we talk cybersecurity. We can't rush cybersecurity. There's this push. We think we're going to boil the ocean. We're going to go from zero to 60 and make our entire organization secure. And a lot of times that's what our leaders expect of us. And we need to change that messaging. We need to change those expectations. We can't secure it all at once. So how do we prioritize this differently? Well, I like to use the metaphor of a castle. And I know the castle metaphor is so overplayed in cybersecurity, but trust me here, I'm going to flip that on its head because I'm not talking about defending perimeters. What I'm talking about is this structure in the middle of a medieval castle. It's called the keep. And the keep was the most fortified structure within the entire castle, and it's where they put all their critical assets. The lord or the king or whoever lived there, that's where they were, that's where they lived. All the riches, whatever was most important went into that keep. And then they built their defenses around that keep. That's how we need to think about cybersecurity. So when we think about cybersecurity in our organizations, we have to look at what are those critical assets first. And then we need to build our different detection and preventative defenses and mitigation strategies around that and slowly build layers out until we reach the perimeter. That way we end up with our strongest defenses around those critical assets. And we can slowly over time get better and better. So what does this look like? Well, first we need to identify those critical assets. And we need to understand the threats that those critical assets face. Now we can translate those critical assets into IT assets. So where my critical asset might be some trade secret or it might be PII information or you know other private data that I have to defend or maybe it's just the availability of a particular critical function. Now I can translate that into IT assets. So I don't start at IT. But now that I understand what those IT assets are, now I can start to establish those micro perimeters. Just what is that one perimeter that exists around a particular field in the database, or maybe then it expands to the database. And then I defend those micro perimeters with encryption or role-based access controls. And then I assess those defenses, and then it's wash, rinse, repeat. I do it over and over again, go back and expand that perimeter to the next level. And I continue to do this, and I do this over time, continuously getting better until I've been able to defend my environment. That's how we have to tackle cybersecurity. Pitmaster rule number three, good smoke is essential. Dirty smoke will ruin you. Now take a look at this smoke for a minute. 
notice you can barely see it. A lot of pitmasters early on as they're learning how to, their craft, they make the mistake of looking for that big billowy white smoke. That's not what you want because that type of smoke indicates that you have inefficient burning and you're getting creosote in that smoke. And that creosote imparts a bitter taste on your meat. Well, the same thing comes when we're talking about our cybersecurity programs. We need to be able to accurately and effectively measure our cybersecurity programs, and that means good metrics. And that doesn't just mean picking some metrics metric out of the air that we're going to measure and just you know throwing those numbers out there. It means providing context around those metrics, seeing how they relate to each other. Do we have more vulnerabilities this month because our code was less secure or because we did more deployments this, this particular month? Understanding those relationships and being able to accurately and effectively measure them, that's crucial to our program. And then we need to set goals. But when we set goals, we need to understand that improvement is greater than attainment. So instead of setting our goals based on, well, we want to have, you know, 80% of vulnerabilities remediated at a particular point in time, or we want to see you know x number of critical vulnerabilities or less in our production environment we need to set our goals based on improvement how do we get better over time how do we establish a goal that this month we're going to be this much better than last month quantifying that and that's where we start to see again that idea of continuous improvement but that's not all. When we're talking about metrics and we're reporting on the effectiveness of our program, we need to take into account our audience. If I'm reporting to my executives, I don't want to go in there with raw numbers. I want to talk to them about the maturity of our cybersecurity program. Where are we headed? What does that roadmap look like? What's the next step? How do we compare to others in our industry? Now, instead, if I'm talking to people who are more at the engineering level, who are on the front lines, yes, then I want to talk tactical numbers. I want to talk about how are we remediating? How do we get better at remediation steps? How do we improve the adoption of security initiatives? So we need to think about our audience and present those metrics in a way that is most meaningful to the audience that we're presenting them to. Don't walk into a board meeting with a bunch of technical jargon and numbers. It's not going to be effective. It's not going to win you the support that you're looking for. So go in there with clean smoke. Give them that clean picture of what they need to understand. Pitmaster rule number four, there's no set it and forget it. When I go out to my smoker and I build a fire, I know I'm constantly having to maintain that fire because I'm trying to keep that temperature we talked about before. Remember that 225? It's tough to keep a fire burning at exactly the temperature you want. So there's this constant motion of going back to the smoker, making sure that things stay the way that I want them. And when it comes to my software development, it's the same story. There is no set it and forget it. I don't just go in and implement a security control and then it's done. I've got these conflicting motions in modern day DevOps where I've got security as usual, trying to push left and become earlier and earlier in the pipeline. But as we have things like infrastructure as code, containers, uh, you know, just this overall environment, developers are pushing further right where their influence is closer and closer to deployment. And then I've got ops who's pushing up the stack because, well, they can no longer think about just bare metal servers and operating systems. They have to understand the code that actually is used to build out the infrastructure on which these applications are going to run. And so how do we, how do we continue to make this better and better? How do we continue to improve upon it? Well, we've got to get to this idea of frictionless enablement and move away from the traditional approach where we just build gates. How many times do you think about quality gates between the phases of the software development lifecycle? That doesn't work as we move into a CICD environment. That doesn't get us on that road where we're constantly getting better and better. We need to bring our security practices into each of the phases. We need to be inherent in the development of software, not just the gates that measure whether or not they did the right thing. So how do we make that happen? We've got to meet our engineers where they live. First and foremost, walk a mile in their shoes.
build that empathy, job shadowing, in building a true DevSecOps culture where security isn't just responsible for security, but we're responsible for making sure that software gets deployed quickly. We're responsible for making sure that software is available 24 seven, that our applications are up for our clients. We need to support the business. That's what DevSecOps is about. We also need mutual engagement, being involved in daily activities, being a part of your scrum team meetings, being at those sprint planning meetings, your retrospectives, making sure that security operations and developers are all there sharing their input. And then finally, it's about paving the road, leveraging automation and tools that plug into the existing tools that our developers already use and give them the ability and the enablement to do it themselves, make them accountable and then trust them to do the security thing. Finally, Pitmaster rule number five, you've got to know your tools, you've got to know your abilities, and you've got to accept your limitations. Now, here's a beautiful smoker. I'm in awe of this. Joe Sanfratello has this smoker. He had it custom made for himself. It has over a thousand gallons of volume of smoke chamber in which he can cook all sorts of meat. He can cook hundreds of pounds of meat literally on this all at the same time. Plus he's got these rotisseries. I would love to have a smoker like this, but you know what? I don't need a smoker like this. I could never make use of a smoker like this. I cook for myself and maybe a few guests. Joe, he uses this professionally. So it makes sense for him to have something like that. But for me, all I needed was this 50 gallon smoker that I bought. It's great. It does everything I need. I can fit big briskets on there, multiple briskets if I want, or I can put briskets in a pork butt and ribs on there all at the same time. So when it comes to security tooling, we need to do the same. We know the marketplace out there in security, right? It's huge. There are all these vendors. There are all these different options, all these different tools that we know we got to have all different categories of security controls and tooling and processes we need to put in place. There's a $177 billion business out there just in security tools and security vendors. But we don't do a good job in security of knowing what tools we need and, and being strategic. The fact is, based on a study by Gartner, most enterprise organizations have over 60 enterprise security tools in their environment. And of those tools, 35% of them have overlapping capabilities where two different tools can do the same job. And the reality is that means that 80% of the tools are underutilized where they've installed a great tool for one niche purpose. And that's the only thing they use it for and ignore the other capabilities because for each niche capability, they go out and they buy another tool. We need to be smarter about this. We can do better. We need to understand our tools and leverage them to the best ability possible. It's because it's when we use those greater capabilities that that's when they work as designed. So bringing it all together. Rule number one was planning and preparation wins the day. You've got to win executive sponsorship by driving business value. Rule number two, you low and slow, you can't rush it. So you can't expect to secure everything tomorrow. Rule number three, good smoke is essential. Dirty smoke will ruin you. So you gotta have those effective metrics. If you don't have those good, accurate metrics that you can count on and present them appropriately, that will ruin your program. Rule number four, there is no set it and forget it. We have to constantly be getting better by building that culture of enablement and accountability, making security a part of everyone's job. But to do that credibly, we have to take on responsibility for their job as well. And then find five, knowing our tools, abilities, and limitations, we've got to maximize those existing tools. How can we tie together different capabilities more effectively? Use those integration points where they exist. 
instead of going buying that next shiny new thing, how can we use what we already have in place today that's already deployed and adopted and make our environment better? You follow these five rules, you're gonna end up with a beautiful brisket. It's gonna taste wonderful, it's gonna be juicy, it's gonna have that lovely smoke ring that you see there, which tells us that we got good smoke flavor into that brisket. If you follow those five strategies for your cybersecurity program, you're gonna get the same result. It's gonna be successful, it's gonna be enjoyable, it's going to make you better at what you're trying to do. So as I start to wrap up here, some things just to help you out. If you're looking for recipes, go check out my GitHub. I've actually got many, many recipes out there, not just barbecue, but other other recipes that I've uh, really expanded on over the course of the pandemic. Also, we are planning Barbicon. It will be a security conference that will be all about barbecue and security. So this is more, this will be the metaphor come to life. Watch for those details. There's the website. You can follow Hacker Barbecue on Twitter. That's one hashtag. Hacker's Kitchen is another one. I use these whenever I post the awesome foods that I make that I love to share with all of you. And then finally, a wonderful quote. I always love to end with a quote. And this one from Albert Einstein. This goes right to the heart of what we need to do with our cybersecurity programs. Genius is when we make complex ideas simple, not making simple ideas complex. All too often, we get wrapped up in making things so complex, we never really get the result that we're looking for. Barbecue can be easy. Making a perfect brisket is simple when we boil it down to those five rules. The same is true when it comes to cybersecurity. Follow these steps and you will get better within your organization over time. Finally, I invite you to connect with me. Continue the conversation. If you've got questions, I will be in Discord, but also you can reach out to me here. You see my Twitter handle, that's the easiest way to get in touch with me. You see my LinkedIn information and my website. I invite you, let me know what you think. Let me know if you've got questions. Let's talk further. I'm always open to hear your ideas. And finally, a great big thank you to Grimcon for allowing me to be here today. S&P Global Ratings for making it possible, of course. And thank you, most of all, to all of you. Thank you for being here. I hope you really enjoyed the conference. I hope you enjoyed this talk. And I look forward to seeing you in real life really, really soon. Take care. Enjoy the rest of your day. We'll see you again.